if you stop working today, what income do you have coming in? Hello and welcome to Pillars of Wealth Creation, where we talk about creating financial success with a special focus on business and real estate. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. Now, let's get to it. Hello and welcome back to Pillars of Wealth Creation. I'm your host, Todd Dexheimer. With me, excited to have John Kasman on the show. John, how are you doing today? Todd, I'm excellent. Always great to talk to you, man. Really excited for our <laughs> yeah. conversation today. Dude, it's been a long time. You were on the show a long time ago. We're going to put that in the show notes. So listeners, you can check that out, hear all of John's story um, and, and dive into that. John's an awesome guy. He is, I'll tell you, one, one of my favorite guys that I, you know, I met him, John, I think man, we met probably 20, like 16, 2017 in Cincinnati. And we're both at this, um, that at this meetup doing this round circle, talking about what we're doing. And, you know, most people were doing, you know, a single family flip or maybe like a duplex. And I think you and I were one of the only ones other than Joe Fairless, our friend, Joe Fairless, he was like, I'm doing like 454 unit, and uh, <laughs> you know, but, but you and I are like doing uh, some apartments, and uh, I think that that's where we struck up some conversations. So that was, it's been a long time since we uh, since those days, right? It has, man. It, what's amazing is uh, I was neither of us lived in Cincinnati, right? right? You came in from Minnesota, I came in from Chicago. I, I live in Cincinnati now, and uh, I recall that because it was so funny to me. You were, I think, two or three people in front of me in that circle. So you went first and you talked about, I believe it was an 11 unit. You were, you got under contract in Norwood and you started describing it. And I was like, that sounds like the property That's I right. just looked at today. <laughs> like I came in town to look at that property. Uh... And I'm like, I feel like this guy said he just got it under contract. And uh, <laughs> sure enough, at the end of the event, I went over to you, introduced myself and said, hey man, that 11 unit you mentioned, it was, was it by an you know, any chance in Norwood? And you're like, yeah. And I'm like, was it on this street? I'm like, oh man, this broker told me it was available. So uh, obviously <laughs> you got that deal and I didn't, but uh, uh, that little competition let me know you were somebody I should stay close to. So here we are. Yeah, watch that guy. For, uh, eight years later, right? Still still looking at deals. <laughs> yeah, uh, awesome. Yeah, so you're in Chicago. I was in Minneapolis. We're, we're at some random meetup in, in Cincinnati. But that's how you make connections, right? It, when when you're in town, especially if you're trying, going to try to invest out of state, but even in state, hit up the local meetups and meet people that are doing stuff. You just never know who you're going to meet. So, um, man, so a little bit about John. I'll, I'll, I'll give a small recap here for those of you who haven't uh, heard him before. Uh, he's a real estate entrepreneur who's partnered with busy professionals to invest in over a hundred million dollars worth of apartments. John also consults active multifamily investors to help them start and grow their business. Uh, he hosts, uh, the multifamily insights podcast, excellent podcast. Uh, it used to be target market insights, but, uh, so you, if you haven't listened to that, check it out. And he's also the co-creator of the Midwest Real Estate Networking Summit. So they host an event in, it's still in Chicago, right, John? Chicago, yep. Yeah, they host that uh, event annually. It's a, it's a big conference. So another, uh, if you're Midwest, listen to this, another great conference to check out. So um, the last thing, and then I want to start with this, is prior to becoming a full-time uh, investor, you worked in corporate America, overseeing marketing campaigns for General Motors, Nike, Coors Light. John, let's talk about the marketing and what you do currently marketing because you're raising money from investors and and you know anybody who owns a business are constantly needing to market. So what are what are the lessons that you took from corporate America that you use today? to be successful in your business, the marketing lessons. Yeah. So, you know, to get into real estate, you know, I, I started off in corporate America, as you mentioned, doing marketing and advertising for big brands. I was working at General Motors. We went through bankruptcy and that was really my aha moment. You know, I watched people who had dedicated their lives, their careers 
to this company, you know, who are lifers, you know, 20, 25 years in who did not have a plan B. They were completely wow. focused on working his good job and retiring at some point with the gold watch and the pension plan and, and all that comes with it. And that got snatched right from under their feet. So I felt a great deal of empathy, but as anyone who has ever feared losing their job and feared how they were going to take care of their family, I sat there in that moment. And even though I didn't lose my job, I completely understood that this was a realistic situation, even though I worked for this huge corporation. So I turned to real estate. And as you mentioned, one of the things that I was trying to figure out is, okay, well, how can I take things I know from my day job and apply them into real estate? Because real estate initially felt very different, right? It's construction, it's cost yeah. of materials, it's, it's builders, it's licenses, it's all that kind of stuff. And I was like, well, I, I don't really know that. I don't have a construction <laughs> background. I don't really know how to estimate the cost per square foot to, to redo a kitchen, right? But what I realized is there are different ways to invest in real estate. Certainly, you can go in and try to be the contractor, uh, but you can also be an investor. You can also be a project manager. And for me, the skills that I brought were more on the business side. So yes, it was advertising and marketing, but it was also project management. It was leadership. It was organizing and managing teams. And that I could do really well based on the experiences I had. So in our business today, we work with everyday professionals to get the benefits of real estate investing without the headaches of being a landlord. Very similar to your business, right? So when we're going out there and we're marketing, a lot of what we're trying to do is just share what we do with people. So it's it's getting on podcasts like this, having conversations with people, hosting events. But ultimately, all we're really trying to do is educate people about this opportunity because most people believe that the only way to invest in real estate is to buy a rental property and be a landlord, yep. you know, buy a fixer upper and, you know, pour money into a renovation project to be a real estate agent or to wholesale. Very few people understand that you can invest in large commercial real estate projects, regular people like you and I, you don't have to be a multimillionaire. Certainly it takes some money, but you don't have to, you know, come from money. You don't have to come from a long legacy of wealth to invest and have ownership in these commercial real estate deals. You know, groups like ours are taking everybody together. We're pulling our money together and, and resources, and we're able to go out there and acquire these larger projects. So for me, with the marketing and advertising, we're spending our time educating people about these opportunities so that they can get the same benefits of being a real estate investor without the hassles that come along with it. Yeah. So you've got the podcast, right? You've got the the conference. Anything else you're doing to help educate uh, we're, we we write blogs. We certainly are active in that space. We write a couple of blog posts, uh, podcasts, conferences. We do uh, some speaking engagements as well. Uh, social media, of course, is, is something I think everyone is is active on. Uh, so those are the main platforms that we're doing to reach people. We do some events as well, some smaller events. We're probably going to step away from the big scale conferences and do more um, more workshop type type events where they're a little bit more intimate and we can really get into some Q and a with folks. Yep. Um, how do you drive investors to like passive investors? Well, who are you driving to those conferences and workshops? Is it passive investors or is it all active investors? It's a great question. So here's the thing, you know, uh, and, and part of how I got into the education space because I hear this all the time from people, but you have to realize, you know, and you get this, Todd, you talk to a lot of people about real estate investing, about multifamily investing. And out of the conversations you have, if you find someone who's interested, usually those people are interested in, in being an active investor. Yep. You know, I would say three out of four, four out of five of those people, they're interested in doing what we do, right? They want to go out there and raise a little money or JV partner. They want to be active though. So to find that person who truly wants the benefits to be passive, you have to have a lot more conversation. But in doing that, that's where I realized, you know what? There are a lot of people who want to learn how to do this. I don't want to keep telling people no. I also don't want people to run out and spend a crazy amount of money to someone who doesn't care if they actually learn the right way or if they have some yep. success. So I'd rather put together something that's tangible where we can guide them through that process and create a mutually beneficial relationship. But as far as finding those passive investors, it really starts with understanding who you're talking to. And that's going to be different for every person. For me, I come from corporate America. 
I understand being in the business world. I understand working at a company where you have to navigate the politics. You've got to navigate promotions. You have to, you know, do a certain thing. You have to put in those long hours. But that also means that you're sacrificing some things. You know, you're sacrificing time with the family. You're sacrificing uh, other things that you enjoy doing. And most of those people want to start creating their plan B. I go back mm -hmm. to my time at GM, right? Um, I could have very easily stayed in corporate America. Uh, I did not get let go during that downturn, but I watched a lot of people get shifted around. And there was a game I was going to have to play. I was going to have to take a lateral promotion, right? Do a lateral move, check a couple boxes so I could come back to headquarters and start moving up. Instead, I moved to Chicago and went to an agency. I went to a smaller shop where I could be more entrepreneurial. I could learn different businesses. I started working on, you know, uh, beer brands. I started working on some other beverage brands like Mountain Dew and Pepsi. Started working on Nike and, again, other industries to just learn how do these industries operate. Okay, how do how do we market here? Where Where do the consumers live here? What are their big challenges? And that allowed me to really grow as a marketer. So when I'm talking to investors, I'm usually talking to people who make pretty good money, but they don't have the lifestyle that they anticipated having when they started those careers. You make six figures, you may be envisioned, you know, again, working your 40 hour weeks, but spending plenty of time with your family, going golfing on the weekends, whatever it is, but you look up and you don't really have those things to show for it. So they're realizing that they can't pass along that W-2 job, your degree. You don't get to inherit that. You know, your kids don't get that right away. So instead, the only thing your children get, they get the assets you have. And you want your time back. So for us, that's really what people are investing for. They want their time and they want to have some assets that they can pass along to their children. They don't have the time and energy necessarily to learn everything there is to be, learn about real estate investing. So instead, they want to learn enough so that they can be a passive investor. So that's what we're doing. And, you know, we're teaching people how to how to invest what they need to know about being a passive investor and giving them enough where they can decide, okay, this is for me. And then from there, they get to choose their own adventure. They either learn enough, like it, love it. It becomes an obsession and they decide, you know what? I want to be more in control. I want to do more of this. Or they say, you know what? This is great. I'm making a little bit of money here. You know, the asset is appreciating. I can see long-term how this is going to save me some, some time in retirement, or maybe this is allowing them to do more things now that they wouldn't have been able to do without it. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, a lot of good stuff in there. I love that. But kids, I've never heard anybody say it like that, but yeah, kids, you don't get, you can't pass your W2 down. Right. It's like, it's, and I don't care how good it is. Right? I mean, you could be a doctor or surgeon, yeah. right? You could be making half a million or a million dollars a year. It doesn't matter. Doesn't like matter. you don't get to take that and say, Hey, I made half a million, give it to my kid. No, you can't get the salary. Right. The moment you stop working, the salary's done. The salary's and done. people don't think about it that way. Right. You think, Oh, I'm making good money. I'm good. No, you have to have assets. And it, it took me, even after reading Rich Dad, Poor Dad and the, the Four Quadrants, it really took a while for this to clearly and crystallize in my head. And that's the way to think of it. If you stop working today, what income do you have coming in? Yeah. And I don't care how much money you make, right? If you make half a million and you stop working most Americans that even make that kind of money have three to six months that yeah. they can survive before they yeah. start running out. Maybe you go a year, maybe two yeah. years, right? But you need you need assets, and you're gonna you know, run out. In real estate is your is your pathway. Yeah, yeah. You can't pass down W two. You can pass down assets, and the last that's what so many people want to do is leave that legacy. You know what I find is is when you're teaching a lot of times when you're teaching people about you know you're running your podcast, you're running your events, uh, your your workshops, writing your blogs, they may come to you initially to learn how to be active in the business. But then everybody goes through their own kind of realization. And some people, they do. They're like, this is what I want to do. I'm going to quit my job. I'm going to do this full time. And that's great. Other people are like, hey, <laughs> I can't do this active. Right. And I thought I was going to do this active. And maybe even I bought a duplex. Right. But I can't continue to do this active. I, you probably get the same type of phone calls that I get with somebody who's got one, two, three, maybe even five, six duplexes. And they're like, Hey, no more. You know, I want my life back. I'm going to start passively investing and 
And uh, this is this is the pathway I'm going to go from now on. Yeah, Todd, and that's it, right? Because the thing that people miss out on, right? So, so the the first part is you want to create passive income, right? So go back to the you can't pass along your W two, right? And, and at the end of your career, when you retire, again, unless you got a pension, you you get the four hundred one k. That's all you have to show for it. So you yeah. need some assets to show for what the work you've put in. So once you've come to the conclusion that you need some passive income, you need these assets. A lot of people go out and they start investing in rentals, right? They buy these yep. single family houses, the duplexes, maybe they build this little small portfolio, but then they come to the realization that what they've done is they didn't necessarily just get investment properties. They got a part-time job. Yep. And the thing that sucks about a small real estate portfolio is there are times where it truly does feel like it's passive income. You know, you could go weeks, if, if not months, yeah, without sure. having to do anything really, right? Mm -hmm. The checks come in the mail. There's no um, tickets. There's no repairs needed. You know, everything is good. But then out of the blue, out of nowhere almost, you could be hit with a tenant's going to move out. So now you got to go in there and paint the unit. You got to turn it. You got to fix this thing. You got to do other things, right? You could get hit with repairs out of the blue. So, you know, your furnace can go out. Your roof, you know, has some damage, whatever the case is, right? So, it's almost worse because you get the illusion of it being passive and then sporadically <laughs> and always inconveniently you get caught with an emergency. And I know when I had my duplex in Chicago in my very first property, I felt like every time my wife and I would go out of town, I would get a call or a text from my first floor resident with something that that broke or needed to be fixed. And it was always some sort of emergency. So then I'm on the road and I'm trying to call and I'm not even there now. So now I've got to, you know, try to Google people and call and get some friends or someone else to come by and, Hey, do yeah. you have this contractor that can get over there? And it just was, it was, it was so stressful and it was almost worse than having enough properties where at least I knew there was something every day or every week that I was going to have to plan for. So that becomes a challenge. And I think to your point, when you have a full-time job, when you have a family, when you have other obligations, other priorities, then you throw this sporadic, you know, uh, inconvenient investment on top of that. It can really stress you out and make you realize that this is not what people want to do. And, and that's what truly happens with people. It's like we know real estate can help you build wealth, but very few people, I don't know anybody who really enjoys being a landlord, right? Like yeah. you can do it because it makes money, but it, I don't think people wake up and, you know, super excited to see what challenges the day has to offer. <laughs> yeah, I don't No, they, they don't put on their super man cape. And like, you know, <laughs> we're going to, we're going to fix this. We're going to get this property, right? Yeah. Oh yeah. man. So yeah, I mean, perfect example, like last night, uh, some of our properties, uh, quite frankly, I don't know yet if they got damaged, but there was hundred mile an hour winds that That's went through there. the town. Yeah. I don't have any calls from my investors right now asking me if we got hit. My investors, the vast majority of them don't even have a clue that that event even happened. And they won't know unless I send them an email saying, hey, our property got some damage from this storm. And then they'll read it and they'll go, okay, they got it under control, right? But if it's your property and you're either driving over there, you're calling the manager, you're, you're dealing with it in some way, shape or form. And it might be no big deal, but maybe your property did get hit and now you got to deal with the insurance company and you got to do all, you know, so there's time and energy involved in it. And some people are like, Hey, that's fine. I can handle it. Other people are like, dude, I got way too much going on. There's no way that's going to work. So, um, yeah. well, but, and, well, and I, and I think too, Todd, the, the, the thing that's, you know, cause people may be listening to us and saying, well, it sounds like that's just a real estate issue. It's very different when you go to larger properties because now you've got scale yeah, and the scale yeah. is important because you have the resources. Like you said, you heard there was going to be this storm, but nobody called you at 12 midnight and said, mm -hmm. Hey Todd, we need you to get over here and check this out. Right. You slept. You woke up, you probably check in with your local team, you know, they'll, they'll assess the situation. They'll give you an update and then you'll figure out what the next step is appropriately. And that's the same thing we're doing. Right. Yeah. So, uh, you know, I, I reached out to my team. Hey, let me know if there's any damage or if we need to get, you know, an inspector or somebody out there, uh, to give us a quote. 
Um, but other than that, I'm not stopping my day. It's not, you know, it's not, uh, it's not the, the kind of thing that's going to cause an emergency versus yeah. if it was a rental property, there's no team to go over there and inspect. You know, I've got to go over there. I've got to assess this damage. I mean, maybe a tenant's going to call me and tell me what's going on, but I really yeah, have to on that, that and then right? figure out what the next steps are. You, you better not be counting on your tenant to tell you what went wrong. <laughs> right. Someone right. will, someone won't until the, uh, until you got a, a gallon of water flowing through the hole in the roof. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Until it impacts them, right? Hey, yeah. my, my stereo system doesn't work anymore. Yeah, you know, exactly. it's got flooded. It's like, wait a minute, there's a flood. <laughs> yeah. It's been flooding for a week. It's like, you didn't think the call be a week ago. <laughs> uh, John, are you paying for, have you paid for any, um, so you talked about social media. Have you paid yep. for any, um, online, like social media, anything like that to, um, bring investors in? So, so from a marketing standpoint, we have actually tried a few different things. We hired an agency to assist us mm. with our marketing efforts. And that's everything from the back end communication, our CRM systems, our funnels, uh, to some of the front end communications. As a marketing guy, I can tell you, even when I worked for large corporations, there was always inefficiency because it's hard. I mean, marketing is one of those things that really changes daily. It's a living, breathing thing, right? Because it's, mm. you put a message out there, you get a response from consumers, you get a response from investors, or you don't get a response. You realize your message was completely missed the mark, right? So you're constantly shifting and it's really hard for groups to get great at everything. So what I find is most groups or most people can get good at something, right? Whether that's email marketing, whether that is Instagram, whether it's LinkedIn, video content, but I have not come across any group. And I'm even talking about large agencies that, you know, the Pepsis, the GMs, like the companies, these people work with, I haven't come across one where they truly are great at all the different disciplines. So when it comes to what we have tried, we've tried a little bit of everything. We've paid, uh, we've done paid ads on Facebook uh, and Instagram. Um, we've tried different things on LinkedIn. Um, we have done uh, video content. Um, we've done webinars. Um, these tactics all work. I, I've seen them work, right? They've worked for other people. But the challenge is, again, you've got to look at how much are you willing to invest in that platform. The messaging needs to be right. Uh, and then I think ultimately you need to have kind of the back end ready to go. Um, I have been less than enthusiastic about the results we've received thus far. Uh, and in fact, we're actually retooling a lot of our communications at this point. So that's something we're just embarking upon. But over the next probably two to four months, we're redoing our website again. And we're going to be changing up some of our messaging to really just... Uh, resonate better with the people we're trying to reach you know ultimately yeah. i think one of the best things as a marketer is to figure out what people want what their challenges are and then figure out how you can help them and either you can't solve a problem or you can't so let's focus on what we can do for those people hmm. yeah that's that's a good point what are, what are people's problems and how can you solve um and for for me i've one of the things i'm working at and i'm sure you're like Duh, you should have been doing that a long time ago is, is really identifying more of who my ideal investor is. Yeah. And because I've been more of a broad, I'm going to throw everything at the wall and, and people will come and you know, that works to an extent and I've done well, right. Raising capital and, and marketing and all that kind of stuff. But I think understanding who your, you know, avatar is or who, who, who's actually who you're serving you know, seems at least to me, um, seems really important. It's extremely important. I will tell you, this is one of those things where I, I will take this directly from my experience in marketing. Every brand I've ever worked on, we started by understanding who our target audience was. Now understand this. There's a little bit of a difference between who, and it's, this is getting to the marketing nerds nuance. So hopefully I don't lose you here, <laughs> but there's a difference between who, your buyer is okay in the target and what i mean by that is let's say um let's let's just use mountain dew as an example okay 
um, Mountain Dew targets kind of a younger drinker, think 13 to 17 year old in an urban metro city. They also target a little bit of an older demographic in rural areas. So you'll see do the do, right? They're getting, they got skateboarders, bright right. colors. It's fun. It's energetic. You know, they're doing the NBA stuff now. So they're going after that young, you know, teenage drinker, essentially. That's who they're they're targeting. That's not necessarily the person who's buying the product, though. Mm. It's usually mom, right? Mom goes grocery shopping. Mm. Mom's the one who's putting the product in the cart. So that mm. kid can tell mom, this is what I want. Hey, mom, I like Mountain Dew. I don't want Pepsi or I don't want Sierra Mist. I want Mountain Dew. It's still on mom to be the shopper and put that in the cart. Uh, conversely, you'll see older folks in rural areas love Mountain Dew. You got 45-year-olds out in Zanesville, Ohio, who love Mountain Dew, right? When you look at the sales numbers, those are the guys who are drinking it the most. So at least this is from, you know, yeah. seven, eight years ago when I was when I was in the business. So when we think about our avatar, there's two ways of thinking about it. You can look at it retroactively and say, all right, well, who, who have been my investors? Okay, my investor is this kind of person. But that may not necessarily be the kind of investor you want moving forward or who you want to focus on moving forward. So I think you need to have a target avatar. And the way I like to look at it for my business is to say, who am I uniquely positioned to win with, right? If someone were to look at me and say four other groups, what would make me stand out where they would say, hey, I want to work with John's team, right? That's where we can lean in a little bit more and have effectiveness. And I think everyone should do that. Um, I'll, I'll use it in a different capacity. Let's say dollar, just dollar store, right? Dollar Tree, okay? So you've got Dollar Tree, you've got Target. Clearly, Target is a more premium brand. Most people would prefer to shop at Target than Dollar Tree. But Dollar Tree can look at it and say, well, you know what? We're going to go after that more price conscientious buyer. We want that person who's looking for value. We're not going to, we can't deliver the experience yeah. that Target has. Yeah. We're not going to spend that kind of money on the marketing, but we can let people know what we do offer. You know, we're about value. We're about stretching your dollar. We're about, you know, whatever. That's what they do. And I think it's the same thing for us as investors. Who are you going after? Are you going after the super high net worth investor? If you can play in that game, great. If not, that's fine. Figure out who you can attract. Who can you talk to? What what resonates with them? What do they need to hear? Maybe they need a little bit more hand holding. You know, maybe they just want to write a check and never talk to you, right? Maybe you they don't want you bothering them. <laughs> They're literally investors who don't want you talking to them, right? They're yeah. gonna write their check, do what you said you're gonna do, you know, send the money, and that's it. There's some people who want to talk to you all the time. They will call you once a month and hey, what's going on with the deal? Just sent an update, right? They they yeah. want that communication. Yeah. <laughs> so you got you have to understand these kind of things, right? Maybe it's industry based, uh, maybe it's psychographic. Because I think that's the thing too. So a lot of times people focus on demographics, but psychographics are key. I go back to the Mountain Dew example. I didn't necessarily talk about, you know, uh, I talked about the age, but from a psychographic standpoint, teenagers are all very similar, right? These are all kids who are looking for their independence. They're trying to figure out who they are. They want to push the envelope a little bit. So from a psychographic standpoint, even if you're 30, but if that fits kind of your mentality, you will you resonate with a lot of the communication, right? Yeah. So some of that is psychographic, and that's sometimes why you can see groups who on paper don't look like they should be together. Uh, but in reality, from a psychographic standpoint, they have the same feelings, you know, um, and not to get into politics, but folks who feel disenfranchised or alienated, like they will gravitate towards candidates who recognize and embrace that and cater to that, right? So, and they could have completely different objectives politically but they resonate to this candidate for co two completely different reasons even though on the surface they look like they're almost in direct conflict with each other right so it's it's one of those things where when you're creating that avatar it's understanding what really drives them what motivates them and then how can you uniquely position yourself to connect with that person hmm. i love that that 
That makes a lot of sense. That's something I probably need to look at more is because I'm always looking at the demographics, not necessarily the the psychographics like you. And I've never heard that term before, by the way. I'm not a marketing uh, guru, so I, I don't. Uh, but something to really think about, and it makes sense with the Mountain Dew, they're not maybe they're focusing on the age group, but they're really focused on what's going on with that age group. People that voted for, um, you know, Trump or Minnesota, Jesse Ventura, they were people that are sick of politicians, right? That, I mean, truly they're sick of politicians. They're sick of the same political, what they call political BS that happens year in and year out. And they go, we want something, somebody different. And that's what they're attracted to. Right. And so, it makes total sense. Like go after, well, then you got to go after, you got to know who those people are. You got to know that that's who you're going after and attracting. Um, if, other- if I can say this, Todd, though, because you're spot on, there's a, I don't want this to get lost. Yeah. Because all the time I'll have people, some of my, my coaching clients, they'll come on and they say, okay, I want to go after high net worth doctors. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's great. Right. Of course, you know, they've got money. So that makes sense why you want to do that. But why would they want to invest with you? And I don't mm. mean that in a condescending way, but it's the same way if you're Dollar Tree, you don't go out there and try to, you know, sell to the Louis Vuitton type client, right? Yeah. What is true? It's got to be true. It's got to be authentic. It's There's mm. got to be something that will resonate with you. So if you come from the medical field, great. That makes sense why they would connect with you and you right. understand their story. If you don't, I think you need to have another connection. Otherwise, you're missing the mark on your target because that person's not going to resonate with you. Yeah. That's why for me, I talk about, that person who was in corporate America, because I was that guy. I watched what happens when rounds of layoffs happen. I watched the politics where I was the guy, but I couldn't be too close to this guy because that guy didn't like this guy. And if that guy went to power, I would have get canned immediately, right? It was just chaotic. And ultimately, I didn't want to be a guy who woke up, you know, and realized that I've been playing this game. And I didn't accumulate any assets that allowed me to take more control over my future. So I work with the person who wants more control over their future, who wants to spend more time doing the things they love with the people they love. We were talking about our kids before we hit record, right? You've got two kids very active in sports. I've got two kids very active in sports. I've been very fortunate to be able to design a lifestyle where I can coach my kids. You know, I coach my oldest son in flag football. I don't coach soccer, but I coach them in football, (laughs) wrestling, you know, like they always send out these things and every time I'm like, Oh, I don't want to coach. They always, they're always asking for coaches. And guess what? I have the flexibility to do it. Yeah. I have the flexibility to build my schedule where I can go out there and do that. And I was very intentional from, from the jump. Right. And I always think about that person. When I talk about investors, the person who doesn't get to come to their kid's game, the person who doesn't get to come to practice the kid, mm-hmm. the person who's tr- got to travel and do all these things. They want to be there, right? They want to have more control over their future. And it's not to say that, they're, they would coach, but I always think about that individual. And those are the people that I want to work with from an investing standpoint, because I want to help those people. It's not to say that, you know, the person who has a family office and they want to write a check certainly will take the check, but I'm not necessarily uniquely positioned to help that person as right. I am the person who is in corporate America, who is looking to find a pathway to have more control over their life. Yeah, you're going to get the occasional doctor that's going to invest in your deal, and that's okay. But you're not, and I'm not, resonating with a doctor. Uh, the people I know that do really well with doctors are former doctors or we're, we're in that medical industry, and that's just how it is. And same thing with, you know, I'm not going to resonate with the same people you're going to resonate with because we have different experiences. We, you know, we, we've gone through different challenges, and so – we're going to resonate with different people. And I think that's, yeah. that's super important is understanding who can you really talk to and why are they going to respect, uh, not necessarily even respect you, but why are they going to value what you're talking about? Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. There's a, there's a presentation I saw. I wish I could, I wish it was my own, <laughs> but uh, it was a great presentation and I forget the gentleman's name, but he's a, he's a very well-renowned, um, writer and he was talking about writing more powerful headlines and the thing he said is in order to really connect with people you have to come at them from one of the four areas they care most about and those four areas are their fears frustrations goals and desires 
So mm. I know we talked about the occupation, but the occupation is really is relevant. What it comes down to is most of us as humans, we have the same fears. Anybody who works a job has a fear of what happens if I lose my job. That's what happened to me when I was at General Motors. I watched us go through rounds of layoffs. I watched my company go bankrupt. I moved over to an agency, and then I watched that agency go through bankruptcy, right? And at that point, I now had two young children. So that fear became real to me. You know, I just had a conversation with some athletes the other day, you know, professional athletes. That's something professional athlete deals with every day of their life, right? What happens if I get injured? What happens if I get cut? So that fear is very real, right? So the fear, the frustration, hey, man, I make. I make four hundred thousand dollars. I'm paying two hundred thousand in taxes, and I feel like I don't have much to show for it. For someone making that kind of money, I feel like I should have more. I feel like I should be further along. I feel like I should have more control. Hey, I've done everything you're supposed to do. I went to college. I got the good grade. I got the job. I got the house. I got the car, and I'm not happy. How do I make myself happy? How do I get more control? How do I get more time with my family? How do I get more freedom? Right. So the frustrations, the goals. Hey. You know, I want to have X, Y, Z, or I want to be able to do this, or I want to be able to retire here. The desires, right? Hey, you know what? I wish this didn't have to be so hard. I know real estate works, but man, I really wish I didn't have to give up my Saturdays to go do showings. So when you start to understand the psychographics of these things, the, the occupation, some of those other things just, they don't matter, right? Mm -hmm. And that's where I think it becomes really, really powerful is when you can talk to people because you truly understand those frustrations, you understand those fears, you understand those goals, and you understand their desires. Man, I love that. That that I thanks so much for saying those four things because that I can really see. That that's what pulls you in, right? We all have certain fears, frustration, goals, and desires. And if somebody can talk to those. You think about any, probably any product you're buying, you're buying it because of one of those four things. Um, they're talking to you about it. So love that. John, um, what's going on in today's market? Like, you know, that's a big question, but what are you seeing? What are you guys doing? What are you looking forward to? What are you kind of maybe shying away from? Those those types yes. of things. Sweet. We are based in the Midwest. We love multifamily. We've always been focused on multifamily. We'll likely always focus on multifamily. We're open to other asset classes, but multifamily is just tried and true. You know, it's simple yeah. enough where most people understand it. Um, we like to dive really deep into it so that we can stay abreast of changes in the marketplace and really understand where there might be opportunities. One thing I've always loved about the Midwest is we never get too high when yeah. the market is great. We also don't get too low when things yep. turn sour. And right now we're seeing some of those markets that were the darlings of the industry uh, not too long ago, they're suffering. You know, they're yeah, seeing rates kind of pull back. Yeah, they had a lot of new construction come, in, come online and those deals are suffering right now. We're not seeing that quite as much in the Midwest. Rents are still right. growing in all the markets that I'm participating in. So we're still seeing pretty good rent growth. We're seeing a lot of stability. We're seeing a lot of demand. And uh, other investors are seeing that as well. Um, I am very optimistic on the near future for multifamily, particularly in the Midwest. Mm -hmm. um, I just think there's going to be a lot of opportunities for groups like ours, groups like yours, to go out there and find good deals that, quite frankly, were getting bid up over the last you know, 18, uh, 36 months or so. So we're excited for that. Um, we're going to be more aggressive with our actions. We're going to be out there looking at deals. I have nine deals right here in my my pipeline that I'm evaluating at this moment and getting feedback on. So we're going to stay active and look at these deals and opportunities and, and look forward to bringing some to those investors in our, in our marketplace. And I will say this, I'm not a time to market guy. I'm not a sit on the sidelines and wait it out like i just that's just not my philosophy i believe you should always be looking and you should buy when deals make sense based on the market economy the yeah. other thing that's really important about investing in the midwest is because we don't have those wild swings we are typically and at least in my group we are investing with a longer viewpoint it doesn't mean we can't sell a property in two or three years but we're not assuming that's going to happen. We're assuming a slower growth period. We're assuming, you know, a more relaxed exit. But we want to have the control and the option to sell when it makes sense, refinance, hold a cash flowing property longer. 
And I think that mitigates some of the risk that comes with investing in large commercial multifamily. So I love that those principles, I think, are coming back uh, into favor. Groups who maybe got away from that are realizing that that was a mistake. And now we're competing on an even playing field because we don't have the groups who are, you know, assuming they're going to sell this property in two years now and just flip it. And, you know, I think everyone or most people are taking more of that longer term viewpoint. And that's allowing us to play on, a, on an even playing field. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think the, if you can have a, a longer term outlook, like you said, like you, you can still sell, right? It doesn't, it doesn't just because you say we're going to hold this thing five, seven, 10 years. It doesn't mean if you look, everything's for sale. If I get a great, if I get a great offer and, and it's going to make a ton of money and it makes a lot of sense, we're, we're going to sell the building. Um, we, we have a building that we bought in 20, what was it? 2018. We refinanced it. Um, got all our investors, their money back. And, you know, the idea is a long-term hold, but I'm, I'm not going to deny an offer. If somebody wants to offer me 20 million or, you know, or more, yeah, we're going to sell it just because we refinanced. It doesn't mean we're, we're obligated to keep it forever. The idea is we're going to keep it for a little bit longer, but man, doesn't mean it. So yeah, I think, uh, a, to me, a long-term hold outlook gives you a lot more flexibility and takes away a lot of risk from a deal than if you're saying, hey, I gotta, we're going to buy this, we're going to sell this in two to three years, we're going to flip it. Like if that, if you have to do that, you have, you have to do it and you can get stuck in, in a market cycle like today. Yeah. And I think to your point, like this, this also goes back to the business side of it, right? Because we're talking about the exit, but there are a lot of decisions, micro and major decisions that lead mm -hmm. into this, right? For instance, yeah. what's your business plan? Are you renovating 100% of the units? Like, are you addressing the major mechanical issues? What's the age of the asset? So we've got to take all of those inputs into consideration yeah. before we build out the business plan and then make these decisions here. And all that comes into play, right? So, for instance, we've got a 2021 or 2019 built property we bought in 21. So it was only two years old when we bought it. That one, I'm happy to hold it as long as possible. We got a long-term uh, oh. debt in place, fixed at 3.2% interest, and mm. we don't have wow. to do anything. I don't have to do anything for another eight years. Yeah. So we're in a great position on that deal. Now, that doesn't mean I wouldn't sell or I wouldn't refinance. Listen, if somebody's willing to hit my number, you can have it. <laughs> like These properties are always for sale, as you mentioned. But if I had an older asset, let's say I bought something that was – 1960s 1970s and you know depending on how much capex went into it what are the plumbing systems what are the hvac systems right you know we got to factor that in because if i hold that 10 years well i also now have to factor in ooh, some of this stuff's going to need to be replaced or i'm going to have to have higher capex and these are the kind of things that if you don't have people on your team you know whether it be mentors coaches experienced partners you could go into it listen to a conversation like this or reading some articles and make a really bad mistake because you miscalculated something. So it yeah. is really important to have the right people on your team when you're building out these game plans, putting together your business plan and understanding what you want to do. So it all has to kind of work together. And it's not just, hey, hold the property longer. You also have to factor in, okay, well, what other adjustments do we need to make if we hold this property longer than initially anticipated? Yeah, I'm glad you brought that up because that that is a big factor in determining your business plan, your offer price, and and how much capital you put aside and all that kind of stuff. Because hundred percent, especially if you're going to buy a building, and even if it's a nineteen, if it may, maybe it's not a nineteen sixty, maybe it's a nineteen eighty, but st same same type of thing. You've got to understand that these big cap acts, if you haven't planned for the these types of things to happen and come up that they could knock you out. Right. And they, or they could take away all your cash flow that you were anticipating. You're, you know, you're going to be paying your investors great returns. And all of a sudden you get these big cap X items that happen and boy, you can't pay them anything for a long period of time because it knocked away all your cash flow. So have to be aware if you're going to hold it long-term, what some potential downfalls will be. Um, are you guys, are you guys as far off on, on offers as we are right now? You know, we it's it's crazy because I keep telling everybody I'm so excited for the opportunities in the marketplace. This is the most exciting it's been for me in in years. 
Yeah. And part of same, it is, same with us. We're still off, but it's not as much. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know, we used to we used to be millions off, right? And now yeah. it's like, oh, we're 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 a little bit off, right? <laughs> um, we're getting the best of final more frequently. We're seeing more deals, and we we see the opportunities, we see the pathway, but there's still a little bit of a gap between where we see value today and where sellers are. And I think that continues to shift, uh, particularly as we hit kind of the the summer months here. You know, one I, I did a, a presentation last year for uh, Dan Hanford. Dan Hanford's event in FinCon. And one of the things that I talked about was the amount of debt that's coming due mm. in commercial real estate, particularly yeah. in multifamily. Yeah. And you want to understand the macro trends that are going to impact the marketplace. And I believe about a third, somewhere around a third of all loans were coming due between, you know, that time last year and, and 2025. So many of those loans are what they consider at risk. And what that means is they either have a, a DSCR that's less than one, or I believe it was less than 1.2, but it was a DSCR that, you know, was in danger of being able to actually cover the mortgage. Yeah. Uh, it had uh, either negative cash flow or minimal cash flow. And I think there was something else on the debt yield. But if you just looking at those metrics, they were saying, hey, a good number of these properties may not qualify for refinancing. So those individuals are going to be forced to sell. If they can't refinance, they're either going to have to do a cash in refinance where they're bringing more capital to the table right. to try to refinance, or they're going to be forced to sell. And that's going to create opportunities for buyers like us. And it's not to be um, opportunistic from a negative standpoint, but the, the reality is they are going to be deals on the marketplace. So the owners who are still looking for maybe a high inflated price today, if they don't have to sell, they'll be fine. But if they really have to sell and they're just kicking that can down the road because, well, maybe they can go another six months or they can go another 12 months. I do think there's going to be opportunities for savvy investors. I do not believe that there's going to be a huge crash or anything like that. I'm also not an economist. I don't make forecasts and stuff like that, but I'm not seeing anything that suggests everything is going to collapse in the commercial real estate space. I think there's still strong demand from a renter standpoint. I think there's still strong demand from an investor standpoint. You have a lot of big capital that's been sitting on the sidelines. So I do think that there's going to be opportunities for us. We're not looking for a crash. We're just looking for those numbers to come down just a little bit so that it can align with where we see value today based on that long-term outlook. Yeah. Yeah. I, I tend to agree. I mean, if, if look, especially in the Midwest, like I don't, I just don't see a crash happening taking place in the Midwest could it happen in some of these other markets? Again, I, I still don't see it happening. It could certainly, but I, I just don't see it happening. I think a lot of this depends too on how many of these lenders are willing to work with borrowers to say, hey, you know, I know you you aren't hitting that debt service coverage ratio. Um, we're going to do X, Y, and Z to help you through. And then how many, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of money that came on the market. John, you know this, that said, we will give you extra money or that cash in refi. Um, for that, we want, you know, we want this high pref, we maybe want some ownership, um, you know, so that, that might be a good thing, it might be a bad thing, but what it's gonna do is keep a lot of these deals from hitting the market. I don't necessarily say it's gonna be a great thing for the passive investor or even the GP, um, the original um, LPs or the GP, but, it might keep that property from going to market, selling for a loss, um, you know, essentially kicking that loss down the road. So, yeah, I think you're spot on there. I mean, that's going to be the challenge we see. And, um, you know, from a from an operator standpoint, it's one thing. I think certainly there are going to be some opportunistic capital groups that come in and offer this pref equity or rescue capital or whatever they're freezing it as today. Yep. Um, but yeah, if you're a, if you're a limited partner, maybe more challenges there. So this is why I think it's really important to educate people kind of going back to where right. we started the conversation. Um, you can do a deal and I'm, I'm sure you've had deals that didn't go according to plan. It doesn't mean investing in real estate was bad, right? It just right. means, Hey, there was something off in that plan or we missed something and how do you adjust? And, um, that's the important thing for me is even for these, these limited partners, um, you know, if you are partnered with the group and the deal doesn't 
end up panning out the way you you hoped or expected, it doesn't mean investing in these deals was bad. It just means okay. that, hey, there was something there that you're going to have to adjust moving forward. But if this is still the right pathway to get you to your financial goals, I would strongly urge you to to stay the course. You know, yeah. I think too often people, you have a negative experience and you run away from something, you know, and it's one of those things to me is, Hey, if you fall off that horse, you got to get back on it, right? You don't say all all horses are mean and evil and don't ride horses. It's no, you fell off. Let's learn from that. Let's figure out what we need to do differently because the goal was to to learn how to do this. So and, and to change our lifestyle. And if you've got a better path, that's different. But if you don't have a better path, then I would say let's learn from this mistake or make some adjustments and, and stay that course. Yeah, too too easy to give up. Um that's you know that but that's the common theme i think that's what separates those who truly see the success and and those who maybe see some overnight success but then lose it or don't see any successes it's just sticking with it right it's it's being determined to say we're going to stay at the course no matter what happens um here we know that this is the pathway to where we need to be so John, um, I got one question that I ask all my listeners. I want to ask you, I know I asked you this before, but, uh, ask you again, what are your three pillars of wealth creation? Oh man. Um, I love that. So I'm going to answer it a little bit differently. So the way I think about wealth is I think about impact. So, um, I initially named my, my coaching business, the capital impact group. And the thought was, there are three circles of impact. The first circle is your family or your close circle, right? So this is your inner circle, your family, uh, your friends, the people closest to you. The second circle is your community, okay? This is going to be schools, your kids attend, your church, you know, those kind of community uh, organizations. And then that third circle is going to be your causes, okay? Are there so, uh, charities? Uh, are there other organizations, other causes that you're passionate about? And a reason I think about it this way is you should be able to define wealth based on your level to impact those three circles. Mm. You know, it's not just about being financially independent where you can pay all your bills, but can you impact the lives of those people closest to you? Can you help the people closest to you live the kind of life that they want to live and give them the experiences that can change their life, that can impact their life? Can you have an impact on your community? You know, for me, coaching, that's one of those things, right? I'm a I've been able to go out there and be a figure in the community where my kids go to school and be recognized for that and help my kids kind of get opportunities based on those things, right? So being able to impact community. And again, wealth isn't just about dollars. I'm not necessarily talking money. I'm talking about being able to impact these three circles, right? Yep. So your community. And then third is the causes. You know, I sit on the board for a nonprofit called Surge for Water, and we're able to raise capital and, and impact uh, really countries where they have a shortage of clean drinking water hmm. so we go out there and we do that we help That's with awesome. you know developing different programs so these are different causes that you know i'm involved in so for me when you think about the pillars of wealth creation i like to think about about wealth impacts so for us it's our my inner circle and then it's going to be kind of our community and then third is our causes john love really love that um appreciate you the level of impact um that you can have really um, when you think about your wealth, um, man, if you can, if you can build a great amount of financial wealth and, and a lot more, you know, right. You can create that impact. Um, that's, that's amazing. John, look, this has been awesome. Really appreciate it. We talked a, a lot of, uh, about marketing. Uh, we talked, uh, some about the economy and what's going on and what you're seeing out there. Um, man, it's been good. It's been good to catch up with you. And uh, I know the listeners uh, got a lot out of this episode. So really appreciate the time uh, you're able to spend with us. Absolutely. Thank you. Appreciate it, sir. All right. Take care, man. Hey, I hope you took as much out of this episode as I did. A couple of the key things that I got. First of all, marketing is a must. We always got to continue to be marketing. And John talked about Fears, frustration, goals, and desires. If we can pull on those heartstrings for people, uh, it's going to help them connect with us better. And it's going to help them um, get to hear what we have to say, which if you're marketing correctly, you're educating. John talked a lot about that. He talked about educating, providing value for other people. And if you're always providing value for other people, you're doing it the right way. 
And so really appreciate John talking about that. Hey, get in touch with John, check out his podcast, Market Insights, and check out his website, kasmancapital.com. I'll put those links in the show notes for you. Uh, take charge of your life. Take some notes on every episode and implement at least one thing, one thing that the guests talked about. I'm Todd Dexter. I'm signing off. Make every day a Saturday. Hey, thanks so much for listening. I appreciate you being a loyal listener. Say, I would love to have you go on to our Facebook page and subscribe. Uh, give us a thumbs up. Go on to iTunes or wherever you listen and give us a rating and review. Don't forget to subscribe. Your rating review just helps us push this out to more and more people and continue to grow our audience and hopefully positively affect a ton of people out there that really need this and, and want this. So uh, the other thing I've got for you is a free ebook on my website. So go on to VentureDProperties.com, VentureDProperties.com and download our free ebook uh, on real estate and on syndication. And I've got some data points in there, some really good stuff for you. So I'd love to have you take a look at that. It's free. I'm not expecting anything from it. Uh, and, and also look, if you want some help in multifamily, you want some help learning, growing, getting your business off the ground, I would love to talk to you about what it would look like uh, to work with me potentially and see if that's a good fit. So you can go up to coachwithdex.com and check that out and uh, we can definitely have a, uh, a call. Thanks a lot for listening. You make it a fantastic rest of the day. I'll catch you on the next episode.